be recording whenever it decides to start. Ah, cool. Yeah, so um, it seems like most of the audience here kind of understands what Google Earth is and the differences. And one of the big metaphors that I like to use when you think about Google Earth, and maybe I'll pop out. So for all of you, this is Google Earth, um, is that Google Maps and so forth is really about um, finding your way, getting something done, and um, accomplishing a task, whether that be a local restaurant, a taxi ride, et cetera. And Google Earth is really about getting lost. It's about exploration, it's about fun, it's about learning, and it's about you know all manner of kind of deeper kind of use cases. So it's not surprising that you guys don't use it every day. I'm sure you probably have all touched it in the past you know 14 some years of its existence. Um, but, but anyway, um, that's a little bit of background kind of on that. And uh, what do you think, another fun one, is what, what do you think is the, the first thing anyone ever does with Google Earth? What is the first thing that you did with Google Earth the first time you used it? Absolutely. Spying on your neighbor's backyard is, <laughs> and this actually happens to be my neighbor's backyard, but yes, uh, everyone always goes and finds their home uh, in Google Earth. And that's an, actually a very kind of important and, and theme to a lot of the things we think about when building this product is that it develops a personal connection with the world and everyone always goes and finds their home and then shares it or something meaningful to them and shares it with someone else. So that's kind of guided a lot of our product philosophy over the years and why also it's kind of a very different product uh, in spirit. Um, cool, but let's talk a little bit more about the technology. Um, so this is kind of what I'd like to cover today. Uh, we'll do a history of Google Earth kind of how we got on the web in the first place, and then so far our journey with WebAssembly, and then also just a few moments on like what's kind of next for us as a product as we continue to progress. So um, just catching up my notes. Um, so let's talk a little about the history of Google Earth. It actually started way back in 1996, had its origins. Does anyone know what this is? You can, did you actually use one? Uh, it's an infinite reality. So this is a Silicon Graphics infinite reality, which is a supercomputer um, that costs about $250,000 back then. Um, and it, it happens to be the kind of machines that was used to actually do the special effects for Jurassic Park, if you guys all remember that movie. Um, but they built a lot of demos back then in order to sell this product to companies uh, and kind of movie production studios. And one of those demos is actually what they call was called a space-to-face -face demo. And this is where the origins of Google Earth actually came from. And I'll skip through some of this video just to kind of keep it moving, but you can kind of see how the spirit of Google Earth kind of came along in this, at the time, relatively straightforward demo. And you can kind of fly in and you'll see later in the video, they're actually moving around in 3D and kind of interacting with this, this rendering of the world. So this is kind of one of the very first and early spirit ancestors of Google Earth came from. Get out of the video. Um, um, and the demo was so successful that in, I think it was 2005, or sorry, that's too early. Sorry, in 2001, um, some of the people from Silicon Graphics actually spun off into their own company called Keyhole. And this company called Keyhole actually built this Earth Viewer uh, and launched it back in 2001. And so this is the very first version of something that kind of resembled Google Earth. And it actually went, oh, oh sorry, one spoiler, but um, it actually was based on um, the same rendering engine as this. Did anyone ever play this game? Does anyone know what this is, Crash Bandicoot? This is actually a PlayStation 1 game, um, and the rendering engine for this system was actually called Intrinsic Alchemy. And this is also the thing that powered Google Earth, and our desktop version of Google Earth actually still runs with this same engine and code base today. So. Um, I won't play the whole video, but you get the idea. So, um, you know, Google Earth in a way is kind of a video game of the real world is kind of the analogy I like to use, especially in kind of a technical audience, is that um, it's a very deep and immersive product from a technology standpoint, and um, but we try to focus more on the actual world. And so this is actually SIGGRAPH. This is a demo of the Earth Viewer um, back in 2001 at SIGGRAPH. And um, this is a 3D shout out. So basically the idea of this is that you have these lightning rounds where you get to do a demo and people actually kind of root for you by throwing ping pong balls at you. And you can see as they're sitting here, they're getting kind of nailed with all of these ping pong balls. And it actually won 
they actually won the, the roundup for best 3D application in 2001. And so the story goes um, that in about 2004, Sergey became aware of, of the Keyhole Earth Viewer. And uh, the story is, is that he actually kind of stormed in and interrupted a kind of an exec meeting to actually show everyone this and fly them home. So even in that moment, that's kind of the thing that really got to grasp everyone to this whole concept. And so Keyhole got acquired in 2004. And then in 2005, uh, Google actually launched the very first version of Google Earth, and this was actually version four, uh, as it was called, and this was kind of the first, um, the first overall version. And then, in it said that this was downloaded over 100 million times in its first week. It almost took down Google servers, and it accounted for over half of all bandwidth at Google for that week. Um, so it was really a smash hit, kind of out of the gate and used by quite a, quite a few people. Um, cool, so that brings us to about the 2005, and, and we realized that, that you know, a lot of people thought it was a cool tech demo and very interesting, but then we kind of had a bit of a moment in 2005. Um, Hurricane Katrina actually hit the uh, Gulf Coast through here, and what we realized is that Google Earth could actually be much, much more. And this happens to be a visualization of the storm path and kind of weather predictions. Um, and But what we found is that even things like first responders and rescuers were actually going to Google Earth in order to pull people and rescue people off of rooftops because we were the only place that they could find and get updated imagery in order to kind of affect rescue for all of these, these people. And you can see that in kind of these slides, and what I encourage you to look at is, let me pull up the pointer, is, is look at this rooftop right here um, and kind of track it. So this is just before the hurricane actually hit, and then that house is actually still there here as it, as it hit, and then if you look a little bit later, this is after the flooding went back down, you can see that that house actually is still there, uh, and then this is a more recent photo here in 2018 where you see that you know only a handful of these houses ever actually got recovered and rebuilt and so these kinds of use cases started cropping up for us all the way back in 2005 and through the intervening basically decade and everything like so we realized that this could be a product that's much much more uh, and can serve a many many use cases and we kept finding those so this is what google earth looked like in what is it roughly Oh, sorry, 2013, I want to say. Oh, sorry, this is version 5, actually, in 2009. And we started building communities in here and started publishing more and more data, realizing that we could serve some of these use cases. And people kept doing things previously unheard of. This is actually what we call, um, we call an armchair explorer. So this is a guy that from his house discovered some previously undiscovered coral reefs just by perusing through Earth and looking at imagery. And these kind of discoveries kind of get made all the time. Even today, there was a whole other set of rainforests that was discovered on a mountaintop um, that was previously unknown about the world. So Google Earth gets used in a lot of kind of different crazy and, and really meaningful use cases. Um, this is another great little use case. Um, this is actually from one of our partners called Save the Elephants. They actually track, yeah, so we started doing these visualizations. They actually track elephants in Africa in order to protect them from poaching. And what you're looking at here is actually a visualization built inside of Google Earth of these elephants moving around the preserve over time. And what you'll see is um, they'll use that not only to kind of protect the elephants from poaching by physically running patrols out in the park and the arenas, but they'll also plan infrastructure like land bridges and stuff because one of the biggest things that affect these is that when elephants wander off these reservations and into farmland they end up destroying these farmlands and then the farmers come after and kill these animals because it's destroying their livelihoods so we can actually build some things to avoid that problem entirely so we found people doing all kinds of crazy things and you can see this is actually a a real-time visualization kind of directly in google earth with some of that so and this has kept happening, right? There's more things. This on the left here, uh, yeah, on the left is the, these are just airline flights, real-time flights out of, out of Dubai. Um, and these are fires around the world that have been detected by satellite on the right. Um, I don't know what year this is from, but it's basically 24 hours of everything that's burning in the world. Um, and there's a lot of that. 
Um, and there was also some really cool visualization is that, you know, EDU kind of started picking up on this. And this is actually a map, a hand-drawn map from 1739, interstitched with modern 3D of Paris. And you can, so you can kind of move around and see what mapping looked like back then in conjunction with what it looks like today. But, and people started forming communities. This is, you know, every star-shaped fort they were manually communicating with each other, sharing these layers, marking these things up, and people kept building and building and building all of this wonderful information, you know, sharing their passions. These are crater impacts, you know, from meteorites and so forth from, you know, many, many years ago. Um, and they were even telling stories, you know, multimedia stories. So this is actually a story that was made during the 40th anniversary. I know we're now at the 50th anniversary of the moon landing. Um, this is actually a, um, a, earth visualization a tour that's actually synced up i'm not playing the audio but it's actually synced up with the radio um uh communication from the actual landing so if you play this video you can kind of see the flight path of the actual lander along with the radio and it all kind of synchronizes up so you could tell some pretty compelling and interesting stories using this product <clears throat> um and even you know speaking of home as being a thing uh, does anyone know this particular use uh, of Google Earth, is anyone familiar with it? Do you know who this guy is? Um, let's go ahead and say it. Yeah, shout it out. Yeah, so the the guy's actual name is Saru Briarly, and basically, when he was either four or five, he got lost on a train in India, and he was he was stuck on that train for two full days, and ended up in a completely different town. Uh, he ended up getting adopted. Uh, by an Australian family and moved to Australia. And so he grew up in Australia. And then when he was in college, he actually spent about two years of his life following rail lines in Google Earth. And he was not only able to find his hometown, he actually found his mother, his birth mother, and his original family in this journey. And you know, it turned into a book and now this, this movie. Um, but it's a pretty kind of interesting and compelling story of all of this and the kinds of things that you can accomplish when we bring technology to bear on some of these kind of problems. Um, what was it? Um, and and a fun tidbit about this movie is there's actually 14 minutes of Google Earth screen time in this film. And, and uh, we actually went back, the director was really actually pretty amazing in the sense that we actually went back and we rebuilt versions of Google Earth that were no longer being distributed that would have represented the versions that Saru himself would have used at the time he was doing his searching. So they're actually reasonably accurate. The imagery itself is updated because we, you know, keep continuing updating, but but we tried to recreate the experience as much as we can in the film. So, and I have to admit, I never actually saw the film, but I recommend you should. <laughs> Uh, cool. Uh, so anyway, that kind of brings us roughly into about 2013. And so this is Google Earth 7.1. And it's kind of the, oops, it's kind of the last major version of Google Earth um, that we made uh, for the desktop application. It was one of the biggest updates in a while. And, uh, and that kind of brings us to more modern era, 2013 up to today. And um, so some background before I dive into that is that at about this time internally at Google, um, Geo wanted to reboot all of its rendering. They wanted to bring together Earth, Maps, Mobile, et cetera, and have one Geo renderer to kind of rule them all. And so they took a lot of the Earth team and said, okay, hey, stop working on the desktop application and start building this new renderer. So we founded a whole brand new code base right around this time and started working on it. Um, and we ended up launching that actually in 2014 for the Android version of Earth, and it was a complete disaster um, because it turns out writing a video game of the real world is actually really hard, and it takes some time. And so the app was not very popular. It didn't render very well, and it was a major set of feature regressions on what we had on mobile at that time. And in you know, kind of typical Google fashion, by basically by 2015, we hadn't launched an update of the desktop application in over two years. And the Android one had basically request and the team itself had kind of just fallen apart. So the product itself was basically on the verge of collapse here at Google. And um, so it was kind of a hard time around 2015. We didn't really know what we wanted to do. We did have this start to kind of a new technical renderer for this whole thing. We have this, you know, now what it would have been like nine plus year 
11, sorry, 11 mind plus year code base. Um, and uh, so we started kind of an effort at Google to say, hey, we shouldn't lose this as a product, as gift to the world. We should reboot it and we should do that. So in about 2015, myself and a number of other people started this path. And this is the path that actually takes us to WASM is during this reboot, you can see we, we did a bunch of these explorations and things. I don't need to flip through these for in detail, but you can kind of see these are just video mockups of like what Earth could be. And if you look at the modern product today, you see a lot of that. You see the exploration, you see the integration of knowledge graph and so forth. And, uh, and then we even kind of keep the mind in the whole data visualization and other things as well. And I'll skip past these because they're, they're mostly just mockups. But at that time, we had some technical choices to make. Um, do we stick with the desktop application or do we move to the web? Um, we also needed to decide, are we gonna invest uh, in our now 11 year old code base or do we, should we double down on the new one? That's only a couple of years old. Um, and this was one of the many considerations that we had at that time. Uh, in the desktop app, you know, you can have more power and control at that time than you can in a web application. Sharing is hard on desktop applications. That's one of the things that like all these great visualizations that Neil Armstrong landing, et cetera, very challenging to share those kinds of things because you literally have to mail someone a geo file of some kind and they have to open it and review it and stuff like that. Another big consideration for us is Earth had never been on Chromebooks. Chromebooks were Linux-based browser devices and they were becoming very popular in education, a space that Google Earth is a big presence in, but we could never offer Google Earth to them. So these are some of the things that we considered and we kind of realized that the web is probably the right long-term future for Google Earth because we wanted to reboot this for you know the next decade. Um, so we also had a lot of technical considerations. So how do you port a million plus line code base to the web? Um, and at the time in 2015, there were really only two options. WebAssembly really didn't exist yet. I think there were some tech demos of it. There was discussion of W3C standards and, and they were working to make progress like it was a concept, but it really wasn't really a thing. So we kind of had two choices. We had it Asm.js and Imscripten or native client. And um, Asm.js, uh, we did actually builds of these and they, they were big, they were slow, they were single threaded and I kid you not, the binary size was 200 megabytes uh, when we would compile it out to JavaScript. Um, but with Knackle, at least it was, it was compressed, it was a reasonable binary size, it was multi-threaded, but unfortunately it had a huge, huge drawback and that's the fact that it was Chrome only. Um, but we kind of had to come to a reality, a, a realization that it's either Knackle and Chrome only or just not at all on the web. And so we decided to take that hit and go Chrome only so we could build for the future knowing that technology would progress, web apps like this would become easier to do and over time. And, and with WASM, that's actually starting to happen for us. So, so we spent basically the next two years um, working and investing on this overall overhaul. And that brought us to basically 2017. And it, actually, before I get into our launch, this is kind of where we went with our code base is that um, most of Google Earth's code base is actually in C++. And then we actually keep um, platform code on three different platforms. So we have the web app, we have the Android app, and we have the iOS app. And um, these numbers are a little bit dated, but this is still a representation of the overall scale of the code base is that we tried to put as much as possible into common C++ code and then only put thin layers on each of the platforms. Uh, we followed what's called a model view presenter design. I think some of you probably would know what that means. And the model in the presenter was actually all in C++ and then the presenter would actually extend into the platform. And then we would do the view, the actual UI code itself, all actually in the direct platform. And that had a couple of advantages. One, the application itself, the render and all the business logic is shared across all three platforms. And, but for the actual user experience and the view, we can take full advantage of the actual platform so we can use all the latest web libraries and components and standards. We can actually access the sensors and stuff on a mobile device. And there are, you know, toolkits and stuff that try to make that native. You can write a web app and compile it into a mobile app, et cetera, but they all have these kind of limitations and drawbacks. And we wanted to really be, we really wanted to feel native on every single platform. So that's kind of why we did that sort of intentionally. And it served us pretty well. Also, we started as a team of six, um, and it was just a practical reality that we could not afford to write three versions of this app. So, um, and then in 2017, we actually launched on Earth Day. Um, it technically became live the night before. At that time, I was actually up doing that change and watching it roll out the production. It came out about 11 o'clock, 
the day before Earth Day. And we launched on web and Android first with iOS actually came a few months later. And that was just a matter of like, we couldn't get the, we couldn't get the UI done fast enough on iOS. So we decided to go out the door with just Android and iOS. And iOS came about two months later. Uh, and this is actually the team by then had grown from six people to about 20. And if you look close in that picture, you can actually see my laptop uh, with all the stickers uh, in there. I'm actually, we're all staring at a bunch of graphs and stuff. When you launch anything, it's really hard to know what happens besides just looking at lines and hope they go one way or another or not. Okay? And then just listen to the press, right? So, so we did that for basically two days straight. <laughs> Uh, and this was the uh, the launch event that I did not get to go to in New York. That looked really cool. So, and we actually launched with a bunch of partners and stuff, kind of in the education space, the public benefit space, the journalism space, et cetera, et cetera. Um, cool. Um, but in that, I mean, it was never our intention to remain co only, and we get a lot of flack and crap for this. Um, but the reality is, is we did what we kind of had to do to become a product, and as through that time, we maintained that ASM.js demo um, that we did way back in 2000. I actually think we did that actually back in 2013. We kept it alive, kept it around. And as WASM started to come out, become available, we, we started porting and, and getting a WASM build going internally um, all throughout. And it ran, it has run at Google for a number of years. Um, and over the past two years alone, we demonstrated at two different Comb Dev Summits back to back, both just a initial prototype and then we'd also did a threaded performance version of the last chrome dev summit and then just most recently but about two months ago uh, we actually launched a public beta so i encourage you guys to all check this out um, i'll kind of show you here as well is that we have anyone can now actually see um, earth in WebAssembly running today and i encourage you to try it out it's just g slash co slash earth slash beta um, and I'll, I'll put that link up later but you can see it's full functionality um it works in firefox uh it works in chrome it works in chromium based edge not standard edge um or old edge uh and then um any other number of chromium based browsers but, but uh, oops and um, we had to offer it. Uh, so here's some more details on just WebAssembly. So we had to offer it in single and multi-threaded modes. And this is because Chrome supports threading, but most of the other browsers don't. Um, and we also disabled memory growth, which was kind of a big drawback for us because it basically kills all access to 32-bit devices. Because if you don't if you don't enable your WASM build with memory growth, you have to ask for all the memory you think you might use at startup. And in doing that, we 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 had to ask for a pretty big number. And it turns out most 32-bit devices won't give us that for a single tab. And so it just crashes. Um, but we're working on that. Chrome's actually adding support to memory growth for threading uh, in 78, next version-ish, 79 maybe. Um, so we're looking forward to kind of get back into using that. That should help um, bring us across devices. Um, and one other notable thing about our beta is that we didn't actually include Safari, but it's not because of their support of WASM. It's because of their lack of support for WebGL too. They actually have a pretty solid WASM implementation, at least in single threaded, but, um, but we can't write all of our shaders and stuff in backwards compatible ways. It's just too much of a challenge to deal with. I mean, everything from our atmosphere to our clouds, to our star fields, to our thing is they all produce their special challenges and then we haven't just been able to maintain both. So our hope is that Safari eventually, you know, catches up. Cool. Uh, thanks for us that have progressed since the beta. Uh, as of last week, um, we're actually building with the LLVM backend for the very first time ever. Woo. I don't know. Um, those builds haven't hit production yet, but they will probably over the next couple of weeks. Um, for those of you who don't know, uh, WASM binaries can be produced kind of in two ways. Uh, you can generate an ASM.js binary and then convert it to WASM, or you can use the LLVM backend to kind of generate and compile the binary uh, to WASM binary directly. Uh, this had not worked for us until the very, very most recent version of Inscripten. There's always been that one last bug, one last issue, and we finally burn them all down. And it is building, it is working, and we think it's kind of good to go, so we're pretty excited about that. The huge benefit there is actually probably build times, but I was talking about Elon with earlier today that might even result in smaller binary size as well, but we haven't we haven't measured that yet. Um, we're starting to look into ProxyDP thread. Uh, this is for multi-threaded builds. Um, 
The really kind of cool thing that I'm excited about in WebAssembly about Proxy Thread is bringing back asynchronousy to the actual JavaScript application. So um, when you run your WASM binary, it actually runs on the same thread as the JavaScript application. Proxy Thread lets you move that onto the WASM binary runtime onto a background thread. And this is kind of really important for us because like Alon alluded, we're, we basically have a huge while one loop in our thing and it just goes in a big circle about as fast as we can rendering frames. And being able to move that off is actually really beneficial to us. And I'll give you a great example of that as we let people bring in these KML files, these GS, geodata files, and they take a lot of processing sometimes to actually load into memory when they're ready to render. And in WASM, that locks the browser up. Um, and normally what we did, at least in the NACL environment, which has the main NACL thread off the JavaScript thread, we'd show a spinning loader with just a little animation in CSS. And that would work very well to at least tell the user that something's going on and they can still interact with the app. But in WASM, the whole thing just locks up. And sometimes for you know a number of seconds. So proxy view thread will help solve this. We're also hoping there's some performance benefits there. That's a little unclear yet. Um, and we're starting to experiment with SIMD. And I just met the person who's working on it. So <laughs> we're also hoping that might bring a little performance, but um, it's maybe not as many as fun. And then one of the big things that, that we need to do on Earth that we're not doing today is around startup time. And um, WASM supports streaming compile. So as you download the binary, you can actually start interpreting it to get it ready for startup. Uh, we make you just download the whole thing and then we interpret it and then just really lags out start time. So. Um, pretty excited about more progress um some lessons learned uh so earth really needs multi-threading i think we learned that when we launched the beta we actually do a little bit of frame tracking so we, we keep track of the average fps of all the people who use the beta and bring that in and kind of look at it and and there's there's basically kind of a a clear step between single and multi-threading and the level of performance that you get uh through that and um one of the big reasons that earth needs multi-threading so much as we spend a lot of time fetching data. So like you're flying around the world, we're bringing in all this three-dimensional data to display to you. We're doing a lot of network fetches and we're also decompressing a lot of data on the fly um, and processing it in order to bring it into the frame and render it. And to not, to have to do that on the main thread constantly will delay and slow that frame loop causing in lower frame weights, experience of jank and so forth. Um, the WASM feature set is growing stronger. It's getting better and better all the time. And, and if you haven't been playing with it, I would, I would highly suggest it. Um, I will say that browser support is a little mixed though. And I think if you're doing some, some basic applications and, and you're, you're happy with single threaded performance, and that kind of stuff, I don't think you'll run into this. Um, a lot of it is there, I think, cross browser. But um, with Earth, we're really trying to push the edge of what WASM can do. And so we kind of have to be very purposeful in, in how we support what features in what browsers and so on and so forth. But uh, we really need more debugging tools. Um, source maps theoretically do work. They keep telling me they do. I, I just, our code base I think is just too large. It just makes it crap out. So we haven't been able to get that together yet. Um, however, I'll say native client isn't any better. Um, it, it's terrible there too. So we do a lot of debugging just with print statements. So, so we're used to it by now. So. <laughs> Um, and these migrations are a lot of work. Uh, uh, we've been working on WebAssembly uh, in earnest probably for probably a good year, if not more. And, and these things these things take time. They take a lot of effort and they take a lot of exploration and discovery to make it all come together. Um, but we're, we're excited, we're happy. And here's actually a little demo of uh, multi-threading versus non-multi-threaded WASM. Uh, you can find this actually on our blog, but you'll see um, kind of how it sort of janks and and slows and how much later the same animation takes to actually get it down. But, and then once all the fetching is done and stuff, they, they tend to sync back up, but you can see how delayed that is. Uh, so what's next? Uh, so what's next for us? Um, one, we just, we wanna launch it for everyone. Uh, lose the beta. Right now you have to go to a special link. Uh, we do a lot of scary branding that says, ah, this is experimental. Like. Uh, for us, this is probably likely to happen a browser at a time, um, just because of browser support and waiting for certain features. Uh, another thing that I think that's challenging for for Earth is um, maintaining 
an ever growing complex set of builds. Um, so for example, we have the knackle build, we have the single threaded WASM build, we have the multi-threaded WASM build. So we could have the single threaded WASM build with memory growth and with not memory growth. We could also have the multi-threaded build with memory growth and without memory growth. We could have them with SIMD enabled and not SIMD enabled and see it just starts to permeate, right? And, and we could give a user an experience in a certain browser with the best set of options and we'll probably do some of that but maintaining more and more builds is is is, is a challenge and so we're probably going to error more on just kind of like as browsers bring in the, the appropriate level of support for us we're just going to start launching on those browsers and wasm is not the only place that we kind of have interest in emerging standards and stuff um other things we're looking for is just better ways to persist data in the browser. There's a there's a recommendation out around just direct file access to where you can let a user just open a file in a web page. We're super interested in that because that's a very traditional desktop use case that our user base really loves to do. And right now we literally copy the file off their computer and back on their computer into local storage so we can display it to them. And that's just silly. So um, um, also, uh, just off-screen Canvas in general. Um, one of the things that makes Proxy p thread work is off-screen Canvas, but its support is obviously mixed on some of the other browsers. And there's other places where we do some drawing and rendering, things like labels and stuff, that I think we could take advantage of this for some performance gains as well. So, so that's really all I got. I, I hope that was at least interesting to some of you about our world uh, and our journey to WASM. We're excited about the future, and we're kind of glad to be here, and thank you for having me. So take questions. Right. Yeah. Um, one good question. Have you taken a look into web GPU? And if so, like, uh, what do you think will be the performance improvements uh, for using it? And what will, what will be there for the, on Google, like, if you want to adopt it? We, we, we are aware of it. We want to try it out. Uh, we, don't, we don't know. I don't know yet. Um, there was some talk going on of trying to do a demo for Chrome Dev Summit this year, but we'll, with Earth. And, and I might have some answers by then. So I don't know. But for now, I don't know. <laughs> Hello. So are you using like web workers at all? Um, in the application, no. But I mean, you know, a fundamental of multi-threading in WASM is, is creating workers. So in that sense, yes. OK, um, cool. But we don't run any of our own workers for any purposes uh, in the application, like okay. the JavaScript side of the application. Yeah, if I may ask, how come I personally I've done a little bit of game development using Wasm. Usually, what I do is I just do all like my actual like application. I, I mean, I don't know how Earth is architected, so please just tell me like you don't know what you're talking about. But <laughs> I do all my processing in a web worker, and then I just pass over what I need to to the main thread to then render my canvas or whatever. Well, so that's what we do with threads, okay. right? Yes, yeah, so yeah, we're doing that in Wasm, and we're creating threads through through P threads, and then we do we, we have a whole job system inside of our inside of our C plus plus code that yeah. All the fetches, all the processing, all the things are done on this job system, which would end up on a web worker in our oh, scenario okay. uh, and come back. So we're definitely doing that. I thought you meant like on the JavaScript application side, are we doing additional processing there? And not really. Okay. Uh, but yeah, we're definitely using workers. It's just the native of how threading works in WASM. So, cool. But it's pretty transparent to us in our application. That's the other thing about our application that's maybe worth interesting is that since it goes on Android, iOS, and web, um, we've got a lot of C++ code that abstracts away a lot of those layers. So like, I don't write to the Inscript and API directly, really ever. Um, we, we kind of abstract a lot of that away. And yeah, we have a whole job system for putting things on high priority, low priority, main thread, not main thread, blocking, not blocking. Like there's this whole system that we have in place to kind of manage all of that for us. And yeah, we work very hard to make sure those things that we're doing are, are on the appropriate background threads and only being only interrupting that main loop when they have to. Um, and that is when you go to, you know, put them in the memory to draw and that sort of thing. So. Right. Awesome. Also for off-screen canvas, I used to work on the AMP team and we were working on a off-screen canvas polyfill. So it might be worth pinging someone from there. Oh, interesting. Yeah. yeah. We, we haven't done a lot of off-screen Canvas exploring. It's been just recently pointed out to us that we should be doing it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, but one of the things that we do is uh, specifically with a Canvas that's not directly in WebAssembly is all of these little labels and stuff that you see mm, uh, yeah. around here. They're actually drawn with a hidden Canvas 
in um, in the, the web application and given back to the renderer to display. And the reason for that is because we didn't want to have to bundle all these language and font libraries into our WASM binary or C++ directly because it just makes the size of the application much, much larger, the binary size of the application much, much larger. So we're like, Android, iOS, and browsers all know how to write text on the screen. So let's just ask for them to give us a label. So that's how we do it. So cool. Awesome. <clears throat> yeah. More questions? All right. Give it up for Jordan one more time. All right. Thank you.